just to the northeast of Impala Plains, um, but I'm not sure if they're going to loop back around. I'm just going to sit on Zoe's for a moment and listen. Here we go. Sorry guys, you're just coordinating a search effort. Because we are right between the two blocks and the kudu calling is right between the two blocks it might be worth driving in a little bit and just having a look around just to go back a little bit just moving through the area. Let's just stop for a moment and listen again. Hopefully the birds at least will give it away the squirrels they are definitely definitely somewhere in this block on our search roughly in the direction of where I think those kudu calls were coming just did a loop 
do calls with further in that direction from my position. movement there but I might be mistaken now this block gets very very thick and it's going to be much much easier for me to get out and take it on foot and have a look around I'll move through much faster than I would on the vehicle and so for now I'm going to send you back across to Steph and I'm going to hop out and continue our search for Shadow and Sindile and I'll be back with you a little bit later hopefully with these two mysterious leopards Back to our car. It looks like Jamie and I are hot on the tracks of of two different leopards. You tracking with you've just been tracking uh, Cindile and and Shadow, and we track in the tracks of a big male leopard. The same leopard that we left you with when we just left the lions. Myself and Viam have been on those tracks from then to now. The nice thing is, is that those tracks crossed out of Bovelzook back into Juma but are in this very thick drainage line on our left hand side. I have been walking inside the drainage line, I was on his tracks for, for quite some time. They head in this direction that we're in at the moment, but inside the drainage line. So now comes the, the, the tricky part. Do we drive around and we hope to bump into him or do we sit and wait for the monkeys to tell us where he is? Um, I do know that in this big tree that you started with over my shoulder, this this is the home of a troop of vervet monkeys between here and a few other trees in the area and I'm, I'm wanting to say that this leopard is going to wake them up at any time now it's just a patience game we know he's inside this drainage line he may have crossed out but the tracks are super fresh and we passed some nyala, we passed some daker there's a lot of food here Now it just becomes a question of listening. It's a crested Franklin. No alarm calls of anything, just fresh tracks. Finding these, these big cats is very much a patience game. Uh, he's walked quite a distance from when we found the tracks. I mean, I don't know where he's come from. We just found his tracks when we saw the lions. Uh, he may have walked far. He may be resting up in the drainage line behind us. But what we are going to do is we're going to make a slow loop around this block and see if his tracks come out anywhere on the road. One of those things, a test of wills. And this is a big Tom Leopard, so he's definitely got all the years and age and experience on his side. Well, 
I've marked in my mind where those Nyala are and where that Daika is. So that if we do hear an alarm call from them, we can uh, we can pinpoint where they're coming from. It's always a good idea. Keep this mental mind map in your head of where certain things are that can help you find these animals. Where monkey territories are, where impala herds live, where was the last time you saw that nyala, or where was the last time you saw that daika? tracks the goodness Juma is full of general game which can act as our sentries Another listen. That VM on the floor there, what is that? A uh, unit track, no? Uh, that's the FBI, you know? Okay, so we've got a track on our left hand side, not too much of a problem. Big a track. Signs of any leopard tracks coming out here. Oh, there he is. Is that a little track? At the actual track. Alrighty. Oh, excuse me. Jamie. not the leopard I was expecting to find but we have just encountered one and we're starting to piece together a bit of a mystery and I am not sure which particular male this is but I'm sure that some of you out there out there do so if you do have any info as to which particular male leopard this is please send it through and we're going to stay with them how exciting is this we thought we were going to get Shadow and Sindile, and I still think we might. They are somewhere in this area. It sounds as though Shadow has made a kill and has come back to fetch Sindile. But it's very possible that this male is also heading in her direction. He's just marking his territory. So let's stay with him. How exciting is this? what I was expecting but one of the things that I love so much about the bush you never know what you're going to find in the morning sky oh and it's a thick thick block he's in stations I've got Shinodore Uwe east of Zoe's Road mobile northwest into the block Yeah, that's a thing, 
be here in my Google Studio. That's affirmative. And I think this might be Tingana. I'm still getting to know the leopards. And I'm sure some of you know the answer to this question. And he's definitely looking around for something. And I'm almost certain that it is Shadow and Sindila that he's looking for. Especially if she's made a kill. Look how spectacular he is. Really, really beautiful. Stay with him. debate as to whether it's Mabula, Mabula or Tibana and at some point we will get to see a really nice visual of his face which should help to solve that. Sorry guys, I'm just calling in some help just in case he does disappear into this thick block. I can't get ahead of him just yet. It is very, very thick, so we're going to have to stay behind him until he does reach a slightly more open area. It's now on mobile, and it's totally rest, directly rest towards the part of it. and shoulders there's barely a neck there he's so enormous Flem and grimacing in response to a scent could well be shadows oh and there's Kudu barking they've just seen him or smelt him to his presence. Um, if you switch off your mover and you listen for the kudu barking, that's where I am.
that's affirmative. Sorry guys, it doesn't matter how many times you hear that sound. It still inspires the most incredible feeling within you. That was so cool. He's out patrolling his territory. He's changed direction completely. I think he might be looking for Shadow and Sindile. are not tattered enough to be in Gula and he's got a lot of skin around his neck which potentially indicates that it is Tingana. Just trying to get Brian the best possible view in a relatively thick block. I just have to tell the other stations who are trying to respond that he's now changed direction slightly. certainly calling possibly to another male but I think he's calling to you shadow just collapsed under my vehicle. I think we drove over an art far hole that has just completely opened up underneath me. And I'm going to just call the guys to let them know where the leopard is so we don't lose him. We did just collapse completely into a hole. We are right over a system of burrows now that I look at it. Diana or Asima, um, my vehicle is stuck in a hole. I need to jack myself out. He's mobile northeast towards Impala Road. I need to really, really quickly get the jack out and try and jack ourselves out of this hole. So we're going to cross across to Steph, and the other guides are following up on where he is, and hopefully, we don't lose him. It doesn't help when the ground collapses under your vehicle. Sounds like you've been having a crazy time with, with the with 
Jamie. Exciting stuff, eh? Well, it's not that exciting with the VM and myself. We've just been and uh, had a look in the area to see if the tracks of that male leopard that we're tracking actually come out of the block that, uh, that we last see his tracks in. And I don't know whether it's good news or bad news to say that his tracks don't come out of the block. Which means that he's in all likelihood still in this thick bush in this drainage line on our right hand side. Um, it does mean that I'm not going to be going very far from where we are now. Um, I'm almost convinced that this male leopard is still in this area. The tracks were very fresh on top of our Hina tracks. They were a different color to the substrate around them. Um, there's prey animals here. We had we just passed Impala. I know there are monkeys here. I know there are Nyala here. And uh, it's just now just a matter of time. Uh, I know Jamie's going to be uh, jacking herself up out of that odd fog burrow that she, that she drove into so that uh, you can carry on with your sighting with Tingana. It shouldn't take too long. These things do happen in the bush. It happens very often, so don't worry too much. While we're waiting for Jamie to extricate herself from that situation, we're going to sit here. Listen, we've got a lot of teammates over here giving us a hand. Nyala, monkeys, Impala, Daker. As the temperature starts to increase, so the activity of the flies starts to increase. Why I decided to situate the vehicle here is the fact that um, anything passing by I will get notice of. Just listening, using all our senses at the moment. This area is very good for leopard. I've tracked leopard here um, a number of times. And uh, it's a deep drainage line with lots of little side drainage lines to it. And inside the drainage line there's these little islands of sediment that have collected up over the years. And on these little islands of sediment you have these copses of trees. And because the water flows down here from time to time, not all the time, but in the very wet times of the year water flows down here. All the detritus is sort of picked up under these bushes and you get you get these open patches between the trees that is ideal for buffalo and all types of resting antelope. We've got some go away birds that are busy calling down there or up up the drainage line. I think it would be a good idea. Let's go and see what they're shouting at. We did find a um, we did find a uh, a bachelor eagle resting in a tree, but he flew off as soon as we got there, much to the dismay of all the go away birds in that particular area.
monkey friends. I can't see them today. They're not jumping around in the trees here where I'm expecting them to be. Just these games to these little spotty cats. It's crazy. Would be a big piece of luck for us just to bump into him in a gap here on the sand. <laughs> or him to come sailing out of the, the bushes. There's a lorry. One of the sentries in the bush, you can see right on top of the tree. Not shouting at anything at all. Dead quiet in actual fact. Too much of a story, let's go down a little bit. More, I want to just place where these Nyala have gone again. <laughs> As we started moving there, Grey Lurie decided to tell us to go away. asked how um, how far are we from Jamie could it possibly be the same leopard I'm, I'm sure is would be the follow-on to to that Rena good morning firstly um, and secondly um, we're not that far away from one another I think as the crow flies we're probably about three kilometers away um, I don't think that they're the same leopard that we're busy tracking I, uh, I definitely think this is a different leopard. This, th these tracks are a little bit too fresh to be to be from uh, from her sighting. Um, not impossible, not improbable. Um, although I haven't really seen Tingana on this side of the reserve. This is more Mvula's territory. Um, I'm fully expecting it to be him or something something like that. The tracks are really big. Not that I remember of quarantine or Kunyuma's tracks. They uh, these tracks are definitely above average for a male for a male leopard. And um, Vula is a big cat. He's a big tom. Squirrel. Yeah. Not in the snow pond. Don't see him now. VM's just noted that there's a squirrel inside here. So we've got a tree full of grey lorries and a squirrel, which is good. They're looking into this drainage line for us right here at the moment. That is exactly what we want. Enlisting the help of our troops. time for me to get my smoker out here again. Flies are starting to become starting to become active this morning I tell you. No, Jamie's car doesn't attract as many flies as yours. 
That is an absolute truth. I think it's my bald head is attracting the flies. We saw it to the buffalo yesterday. Lots of flies around. Big shiny bald buffalo. <laughs> yes, I just got this tail flick. I thought, no, I can't be that lucky. See if we can get inside there. There you can see what caught my eye. Just that little flick of movement. And that's a great day, Kerb, busy eating some seeds in that, uh, that Tambuti thicket. Yeah. Another one of those things that just say to me that this cat is somewhere, somewhere inside this block. There's just too many prey species for, around for him to have moved through here already. not, not uh, unfeasible to think that he's already moved through you know it's actually completely more feasible to think that he's moved through than anything else to be honest with you down here and see what's inside this little drainage line quickly. Of course the other part of this puzzle that we've uh, we've been wanting to, to unravel for a couple of days is where has the hyena den gone? All my investigations so far into asking uh, our colleagues, Texan for instance, there's been a game ranger here for 20 odd years or so and he would be the first person, he was the first person that I went to go and ask. And he just replied with a simple, I don't know. Which, uh, which means that these Ahina have managed to give us all the slip, which is, un which is unusual. Most of these ranges are pretty much on top of these things. You can ferret it out. Ahina are very difficult to track. We're just going to go under this tree. An elephant has broken the branch off of this knob thorn. don't know where these ahina have gone. I think they may be on a den site on the eastern side of the Mulwati. That's what I think they've moved to. We're not seeing a lot of tracks, not as many tracks of ahina as we used to when the den was close to the camp. Um, definitely it seems as if they've moved off somewhere. But now it just becomes a trick of following tracks backwards and forwards and seeing where tracks overlap one another. And that is what I've been keeping my eye out for for the last couple of days and up to a week. Where you have overlap of tracks, it's generally a good sign that there are 
that there is a hyena den in the area. A hyena, they don't like to walk the same road twice. In actual fact, they try and avoid walking the same road twice if they can. I'm just finding fresh ahina tracks on the road, all moving around. Uh, just within a few short days literally a couple of days ago right here where we are now there was then kahumas on a dead buffalo and the birmingham's causing absolute chaos in this area chasing around the sticks pride killing their cubs roaring their heads off chasing the matimbas around Talking about the Matimbas, I haven't seen the Matimbas in quite some time. I haven't even heard where they are at the moment. I would imagine that they're hanging around with the Styx Lioness, especially if they've, if they've got a cub left over. I haven't seen those Lioness at all. driving around here having a look for this male leopard who is giving us the slip at the moment but which I have no doubt is just resting up in the shade of that drainage line where we were just next to it. Um, Paul uh, from Los Angeles has asked um, a couple of months ago we were look at those squirrels here while I have a chat a couple of months ago we were concentrating most of our show on Kunyuma and Quarantine and Karula and you're quite right to make that note uh, Paul that we haven't seen Quarantine, Kunyuma or Karula in quite some time and the emphasis has sort of shifted over to um, the Birmingham boys, the Sticks Pride, the Nankahumas um, and you wanted to know does lion activity actually affect leopard movement? And the short answer to your question, Paul, is, is no. Lion activity doesn't affect leopard movement at all. They live uh, or they cohabit with one another. Uh, they're not friendly with one another, but they definitely share the same bush with one another. Um, but what happened was Kunyuma and Quarantine were Karula's cubs. And they reached maturity and it's natural for them to move out and go and find their own territories, especially to male leopard, far away from their mother's territory. Um, and we saw that over the period, literally it happened almost overnight. Unlike lions, uh, this happened almost overnight. Uh, Tingana and Vula came onto Juma. They, was, they spent about a week here and literally quarantine and uh, Kunyuma disappeared. Um, from what we hear, they're hanging around in adjacent reserves and doing very well. Karula has always been quite a secretive cat. Although most of her territory is, is, uh, is inside Juma, with a little bit into Buffles Hook and Torchwood, um, she is a cat that is absolutely uh, doesn't like walking on roads. She doesn't like being found. And we do find a lot of female tracks in her territory, but it quite often doesn't result in us finding any, uh, any, of, any of those um, 
or any sign of her in actual fact, other than a few tracks before she crosses out again. Um, so I hope that answered your question. I hope that uh, that uh, Karula is pregnant. She seems to be mating. We seem to have seen her mating with a couple of female, a couple of males, over the course of the last few weeks. Her body might be battling to take. Um, she's not the youngest leopard anymore. Um, and sometimes it does take a little bit of time for leopard f to fall pregnant. I'm hoping that she is carrying a some babies in her belly and I hope that she gives birth on Juma again because it would mean that we have some resident leopard for a while while they grow up um, for the moment we've just got the normal leopard activity um, and I'm gonna place emphasis on the fact that I said normal leopard activity because that's exactly what it is we've got a couple of adult females in Shadow and Karula on the property and we've got a couple of adult males in the form of Tingana and Mvula on the property with a few nomads. We've got, uh, we've got that uh, shy Manuleti male that's come in and um, we sometimes get uh, tracks of a male leopard again on our eastern boundary which may or may not be Kanuma or Quarantine, tough to say. But though this is normal, normal is to have three or four leopard on your property, especially a property of this size. Um, and you see them from time to time as they move through the bush and leave passage of their signs. Or signs of their passage. This morning my brain is everywhere except for in a straight line. Please excuse me on that. off chance of us finding some tracks of this male leopard that we're busy tracking maybe he jumped across a road maybe he ran changed direction drastically but his tracks absolutely don't come out onto any of these roads where we've been at the moment and I can it just further cements my impression that I think that this male is lying somewhere inside that drainage line where we left it and Safari have come on, they're having a bit of a debate on what leopard it is that we're tracking at the moment. And I must agree with you, uh, um, Safari, that I also think that it's Mvula. The tracks are Mvula size. The tracks are in slap bang in the middle of where we know Mvula to, to um, occur and his, for his territory to be. Um, we also know that Tingana is busy pushing up from the Arethusa side, which makes sense for Mvula's tracks to be here in response to that pressure. Um, and then Raisa has made a comment that says that uh, uh, we haven't seen Mvula since he stole a kill a couple of months ago. And that's true. I can't remember the last time we actually saw, or I actually saw Mvula was probably in April. Uh, no, May. Um, admittedly, I don't go on as many game drives as uh, I, I do, uh, or I should be doing. Um, but yeah, we don't see him very often. Male leopard in, this, in the Sabi Sands have territories that are around about 5,000 hectares big. Now let me put that into perspective for you. Um, 5,000 hectares for a male leopard is around about what the lion prides in this area have. So you're looking at anywhere from, what's it, we've got lion prides of six, seven individuals over here at the moment with their tending males occupying the same area as one highly camouflaged very secretive cat in a leopard um, they are sometimes difficult to find you do go through these patches though where leopards just seem to be jumping out of the bushes everywhere i remember the first time i started here with uh, wild earth when we were busy debuting the walks um, myself and scott seemed to be finding leopard under every bush we, we, we actually couldn't believe what we were seeing
everywhere we went, there was just leopard jumping out of every bush. Karula was jumping out of the bush, and Vula jumped out of the bush. We were seeing Tingana, we saw quarantine numerous times on foot. And that was just literally in April, May of this year. Now, we seem to be in a bit of a leopard drought. Although for those of you who are going to be following me over the next couple of months and years, me having leopard drought is a very common thing. It's a common occurrence I've had in my career. <laughs> I've, uh, I seem to have these droughts from time to time of a variety of different animals. <laughs> It is a very big, uh, it's not, I don't take it personally anymore, um, my teammates generally use it as a goad to get me uh, to rise to the occasion, but I just find it quite funny. I have yet to determine the source of my bad luck, whether it's walking under ladders or staring into mirrors or whatever it is from a superstition point of view. leopard tracks coming out on this road. I think, let's go and have a look at uh, Bifflesuk Dam. That's what my brain is telling me at the moment. Um, the reason for that is that, I mean, we just, I'm just cancelling out options over here. We're cancelling out the fact that this cat may have carried on in his original direction rather than turning off, even though I was expecting him to turn off where he did. Pickers flew up over here, and that's because we've got a female kudu just next to us. It'll also give me a chance to switch the car off, stop yakking, and listen to the bush a little bit. My sweetheart, why are you eating the driest leaves that there are? The reason for that is that that's a buffalo thorn that she's busy chewing on. Elephant has knocked the tree down. And even though these leaves are dry, you probably find they still hold more nutrients than a substandard bush would. Buffalo thorn, buffalo thorn leaves are, are highly nutritious, full of protein and a sought after delicacy for kudu. Not in bad condition, hips are sticking out a little bit, that full belly typical of ruminants this time of the year, skinny with a full belly, that is very typical of ruminants in the middle of the dry season. Quite a big animal, she probably weighs Around about 80 to 120 kilograms, about 200, 240 pounds. lips to pick off the leaves literally one by one. The long nose is an adaptation to get past the thorns, keeps the eyes away from the thorns so that elongated face. One ear on us pink in the middle which is diagnostic for the kudus and no horns females of this species have no horns just the male these beautiful corkscrew horns now female kudu are very rarely alone and I have no doubt that there are some more kudu around here there has to be it would be very atypical for this female kudu to be on her own
listening to us. Now, something I noticed on a kudu just the other day was the fact that just in one of their ears they had some flies. And I want to see if the same goes for this female. Her ears are definitely not as clean as that other kudu we were looking at it two or three days ago. Got some dirt in it. But it's just dirt and not parasites. So she's in good condition, her body is still in good condition. You find that when the parasite load, when the tick load increases dramatically or drastically in a, in a ruminant, it does mean that they are, their bodies are, are not capable of withstanding it. Healthy animals don't attract um, ticks as easily as unhealthy animals do for some reason. Their bodies are able to better fight the ticks off or they, gro they have more energy to groom more. I'm not too sure what it is, but... You don't really see high tick loads on on healthy animals. As I'm saying that, it says something for the fact that I pick up more ticks than what Scott and Brent do, and they're probably the two unhealthiest people I know. Worrying thought. Anyway, she's moving off. It's our cue to move off as well. Had a good listen now around the Oh, there we go. There's a... VM's just spotted the other kudu from her herd. So there. So pretty typical couple of female kudus around nice yeah. I still think that we're going to have a look at um, at bubbles of dam yet. I haven't heard any alarm calls yet. And while Jamie's busy getting herself out of that hole, she's still stuck in that odd far cold. It was obviously a bigger hole than what we anticipated. It can sometimes be quite difficult to get out of those holes. You've got to jack the car up. It's dangerous. You've got to get a spare tire into the hole. You've got to lower your car down onto that spare tire. You then... Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. You've got to lower your car down onto that spare tire and then uh, you've got to pack up everything when it finishes again. And of course, there's all the variables of sticky jacks and spare tires that don't want to fit into the hole and you've got to find sticks your car falling off the jack it can be quite a mission Driving, of course, um, you're 
welcome to send through any questions using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email questions at wildearth.tv. And Dave in Toronto has done exactly that and asked me a question about carmine beaters. Do we have carmine beaters here and would it be possible to see carmine beaters on drive? Uh, Dave, yes, absolutely. We do get carmine beaters here. They are migratory, intra Africa. Uh, intra-African migrants, which means they stay in South Africa. Um, we'll be able to see carmine beaters around Christmas. Christmas time, January to February, they come down here to feed primarily on termites, and then they head back up to Botswana and Zambia. Um, the most impressive carmine beater sightings that I've ever seen have been in the Okavango Delta and in Zambia in the South Luangwa National Park, um, where these carmine beaters actually tunnel into the banks above the rivers um, and you can actually float your boats down right next to these uh, these these um, you can actually float your boats right down next to these uh, these banks these nesting banks and have these clouds of birds flying around you so Dave I think if you were to go to the South Luangwa National Park in October you would definitely be surprised at the clouds of carmine beaters literally at the end of your fingertips. They fly around you in these huge clouds. It is honestly a sight to see if that is what you want to be doing in Africa. Um, otherwise, we'd probably be able to show them to you on the show in about December, January. Late December, January is when they come down here for the termite fest. So many birds come for. In actual fact, the, the birds that come the furthest just for the termites would be the steppe eagle and the steppe buzzard. Come all the way from the steppes in Russia and fly all the way to South Africa just for termites. Can you believe it? Get enough energy in a few short weeks to make it worth the trip all the way back there again to go and breed in Russia during their summer. Although from what Alex tells me, it's not quite the dreary place that we grew up to believe. I have in my mind the fact that Russia is just this one endless expanse of cold and freezing grey snow, when uh, it's anything but that, especially in summertime. All thanks to Alex that's been educating me about his country. Oh, and uh, James's recent trip. I'm still busy checking for for tracks. We are a bit away from uh, from where we saw uh, from where we saw those last fresh tracks, but I'm going to be heading back into that area now. Barbara, I'll coming back uh, with some questions on my comments about finding the hyena. Um, and the radio is quite sketchy at the moment, so I'm only getting a, a couple of uh, snippets of that, but uh, but not too much of a worry. I'll try my best to try and answer it. Um, Jojan wanted to know if the hyena have actually left the area, um, and I'm not too sure that they have, to be quite honest with you. I think that they're still in the area. I actually just think that we're not finding their den. Um, I think it's a case of them having moved out of the block where we where it's very close to uh, to, uh, to the camp. We've got easy access to that and because we are around there most of the time. We see it into an area where we don't drive around as much, and I think that's exactly why we're not uh, we're not getting to the bottom of this of this uh, quiz, I suppose. Well, this puzzle is actually the better word um, of finding out where these ahina are. Um, and then the next question was centered around um, the babies, the little black cubs that we were seeing. Um, if they had to move, would they move far away or would they be picked up by their parents? Hyena are 
in my opinion, fantastic parents. Uh, but part of this being a fantastic parent, I suppose, is being or having tough love every now and again. And Ahinas are quite, they have quite a tough love strategy. And the babies, especially those black ones, would be expected to walk as far as they were capable of walking. And only in the last little bit, uh, through exhaustion, will the mother Ahina pick them up and take them the rest of the way. Um, We're just gonna sit over here. We've got some dwarf mongoose that are poking their head out of this. What a fantastic den site. This guari tree and a milk berry are growing on top of this termite mound and in the roots of these two trees some dwarf mongoose have excavated themselves a home. We spent some time with some dwarf mongoose on yesterday afternoon's drive. And once they get used to you, they can actually become quite comical to watch. They live in family groups, usually around about 12 individuals, but up to 32 individuals are actually found in some family group, all headed up by an alpha male and female. And all the little ones that you see around are successive generations of babies uh, that are sort of communally looked after. Uh, every day there will be a babysitter allocated, which will have the task of staying with the babies, carrying them around, bringing them food, sharing food, playing with them, grooming them. Um, and that babysitter changes throughout, through, I don't know if it changes throughout the day, but definitely changes day to day. And they will also move homes every single day to avoid predation. So although they are in this termite mound today, in their little one square kilometer of territory that they forage around in, they'll have numerous burrows and they'll move one burrow to another burrow to another burrow. Just to avoid being preyed upon. Now these are not to be confused with meerkats, which you also find in South Africa, but meerkats you find up on the on the inland plateau. Uh, you don't find them in the low-lying areas close to the coastlines. You just find them uh, on the inland plateau and generally in a few in drier areas. Uh, I've only seen meerkats in the Kalahari and on the fringes of the Kalahari itself. And we get the southern Kalahari into South Africa. It stretches into the northern Cape province and into northwest and a little bit into the Orange Free State as far as I can remember. And it is increasing in size every year. Luckily for me, it is my favorite place. The entire Kalahari Basin is one of my favorite ecosystems that I've visited in South Africa, between Namibia, South Africa, Botswana, a little bit of Angola, and a little bit of Zambia, I really, really enjoy the Kalahari. Uh, it is a very diverse, incredibly rich area that I've had some amazing experiences in. You've got a youngster that's picked his, his head up. Now, they'll be resting out here in the early morning sun, just getting themselves organized for the day. Uh, because they eat mainly insects and lizards, they will also eat eggs, baby ground birds that they find, and even mice. They find a lot of what they're looking for 
within quite a quick space of time. And so they can afford to be as social as what they like. And they quite often spend the morning grooming one another, lying in the sun, rest and relaxing as you can see them doing in the entrance there to their burrow. Then they'll forage for a, sh a few short hours during the day and then go back to doing pretty much exactly the same thing in the afternoon. sounds of some elephants in the distance. I think let's carry on with this road and see if we can bump into them. Elephant noises of crashing trees are coming to me out of, uh, out of the bush on our left hand side. time for me to have my weekly groom the little bit of hair that I've managed to grow on the side of my head and on the side of my face I'm going to be cutting short probably today Sunday is the day that I do that I tend to love the sort of chaos of the bush with the routine with the structured routine that I'll be having that's sort of how I like to operate in is an incredibly tough area to get a car into. I'm not going to stick around for too long in this area if, if they don't present themselves. The reason being is I want to get back into that area, into the immediate area around where we last saw those leopard tracks. As far as I can tell, he hasn't left that block. Um, temperature at the moment is picking up quite nicely there's a lot of prey species around that block that we were at and if I were him I would have lain down moved lain down moved but at some point he is going to disturb something and I want to be in the vicinity when he does so that he can help us pinpoint his position to just sort of aimlessly run through the bush is doable um, it's effective uh, but with Jamie stuck where she is, not really an option for me right now. But not to worry. Many things to look at out here, I'm sure. Look at this, this is exactly the same den that we were at yesterday and just to let you know that they haven't moved on, we saw them yesterday at least an hour before sunset. And I mean these two, these two, uh, these two mongoose groups are actually very close to one another. Just goes to show you how small their territories actually are. I mean at one square kilometer, 0.6 of a mile, They're one of the more common of the mongoose species. They're actually one of the more common mammal species that we see out here boring in Pala, I think. And yes, they will actually battle one another for territory. They will actively defend territories against one another and some pitched battles can actually happen.
But anyway, I think let's carry on. Now the temperature has increased from an hour and a half ago from 11 degrees centigrade to about 18 degrees centigrade. So today it seems like it's stacking up to be a warm day. Um, I think that's around about 55 or 65 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit already, I think, around about there. The elephant doing very thick bush off to my left hand side. I think we're going to pass on. is standing right next to the road. I think it's going to be virtually impossible for us to get to where these elephants are. Oh, there we go. I can just see one in the distance. Not close enough, and you'll see why now when we see him. You can have a look at that bush over there. Have a look at what we'd have to drive through. And there's a big drainage ditch between us and that elephant. Definitely not an easy task to get to. I can see two elephants from where I am, but I'm sure that there are more of them. That's just the back of one of them. Have a look at this bush. Virtually an impenetrable wall. And there's a big drainage line, a big gully between us and the and the elephant. Have a look at that. <laughs> I don't even think if I'd walk through there. But nonetheless, let's carry on going. I still want to go and have a look at Bufflesook Dam quickly. I think let's go and do that. And then we'll take the cut line back to where we saw those leopard tracks and hopefully something busy shouting at our leopard or he's lying on the side of the road. It's all thumbs. Day. There's a coolish breeze that's blowing. When I walked out of my my room this morning, I actually was quite surprised at the temperature, but it warmed up quite quickly. So I don't know what's happening in the country. I do know that there's been a cold front that came through Cape Town yesterday, and that it was absolutely freezing there yesterday. Lots of rain, wind, icy cold water. Not my favorite place this time of the year. Tennessee, while we're busy driving around, obviously the hot topic of conversation at the moment is uh, is all the lion activity that we've had around the place over the last couple of weeks, or over the last week I should say. And so Rena in Tennessee has asked, would the Birmingham boys and the Matimbas be able to coexist and live alongside one another? Um, yes is the answer to that question. They're not going to coexist, they're not going to tolerate one another, but they have to live alongside one another. Um, the Matimbas were holding on to too many prides of lion over too big an area. It was just a matter of time before other male lions came into this vacuum, and the Birmingham boys have stepped nicely into this vacuum. I am seeing that because we're not seeing the Matimbas anymore as much as what we used to, I've got a funny feeling that these Matimbas have just 
constricted, constricted where their core territory is, which would be around about the Styx Lioness Pride. Um, and are leaving the Kahumas to the Birmingham boys. That's what my feeling is telling me. That's, uh, that's what my intuition is telling me. And so what will eventually happen is the Matimbas and the Birminghams will have a core territory that they would actually defend with their lives. Um, and they would have a home range with a slight overlap. And uh, that overlap is where you're going to get all this raw and this posturing and every now and again the odd squabble and make no mistake if the Birminghams bump into one of the Matimbas alone uh, in this home range they will definitely fight <coughs> excuse me but they will live in an uneasy sort of truce with one another alongside and adjacent to one another so male lions absolutely cohabit with one another especially their natal pride or their natal group their coalition and they have an uneasy truce with their neighbours to all sides A similar question, only given the two prides a bit of a name. The Majingalan males and the Matimbas and the Birminghams are basically the male lines that we see here. And the same answer applies to that question. Um, it would be an uneasy truce. The Birminghams are coming in to muscle their way into this territory. Once they've figured out where their boundaries are, where their core territory is, and they've settled, then the Majingalans and the Matimbas and any other male coalition that's around this area, their home ranges are like an amoeba. They'll be growing and there'd be pressure on the one side and then they'd re respond and pressure on the other. And the, the home ranges are constantly shifting around their core territories. Um, but basically the same. Once the, Maji once the, uh, the Birminghams have settled and laid claim to a particular area, they will absolutely... Um, in sort of an equilibrium, let me say, with the male lions around there. The Matimba's territory is going to sh shrink, and I'm sure because of this power vacuum that's existed, the Matimba lion's territory will also shrink a little bit. Let's have a look at what's happening here at the dam. Ooh, the flood, man! They are really starting to heat up. And surprise of surprise, nothing much happening over here, just one hippo. Bob, as James affectionately calls him. Let's have a quick look at Bob. See if nothing is hanging around here that isn't at first glance apparent. chilling in his pond. <laughs> I can say that, you know, it always amazes me the fact that these hippo, you got, he is a male hippo, female hippo definitely won't be alone in ponds like this. Um, and how they can, uh, just sort of exist on their own. They are very, they're contact species. They, they love socializing, but this is obviously a male not holding the most prime territory and also not able of, or able to cut himself out females that want to stay. So I would say that he's definitely a mature bull, but he's still a youngster. And uh, as he gets older, he'll definitely start cutting some females out, probably from the, uh, the females in... Uh, Sydney's dam out near the gate or maybe he even goes down to the Manuleti to go and cut himself out some females from there also, and If you go up to the bird over there be able to tide kingfisher we may be able to see him fish I doubt it 
It doesn't look like he's fishing from where he is. It's a kingfisher that likes to hover. Which of course opens up a, another topic for me to discuss is stratification. It's a word that I really enjoy because we really get to see it so often. So most kingfishers hawk from a perch. They sit on a branch and they will hawk from, from a branch to a place to pick up prey and back to their branch again. Obviously the bigger you are, the bigger the fish that you can grab from that particular perch but you're still limited to the fringes of any water body. These pied kingfishers have managed to get a, uh, these pied kingfishers managed to get a, a, over that difficulty. Not only are they quite big, which allows them to feed on quite a wide range of fish, but they can hover over water bodies, which allows them to go and fish near the middle of channels and in wide stretches of water. You see these kingfishers busy hovering really are an amazing bird to uh, to watch. Very clever in my opinion. A kingfisher that sort of thinks out of the box for lack of a better word. Now this one's just preening itself. Might have already had breakfast. It looks like it's got that sort of wettish look like he's been fishing all along. All those nests that you're seeing there in the tree, those are all red-billed buffalo weaver nests in this green thorn. Red-billed buffalo weaver are one of only three buffalo weavers, or only three weaver species at least, uh, in the subcontinent here that actually build communal nests. And these messy nests are all chambers, many chambered homes of one pair. let's carry on I really am starting to feel like I need to get back to that area where we had those fresh leopard tracks and see what's happening over there by now something must have happened but I have just had a report from the final control Tara was busy telling me just to let you, let me know that I can tell you that uh, Jamie's doing okay the vehicle is still stuck but we're just going to go through a dip. Signal's going to get a bit bumpy, so I'm going to stop talking. We'll catch you on the other side of this dip again. Don't go anywhere. should be better now and now you know what I've completely forgot my train oh um, excuse me this, this morning crazy with my memory for some reason so uh, Jamie is doing okay she's still stuck in her uh, in her termite uh, in her oddvog burrow which is uh, it must have been a big crash that um, but Eugene has managed to go to the rescue, so the Eugenius, or the Eugenie as we like to call him, is uh, going to go and work his magic over there, and he's en route to go and give Jamie a hand. Obviously two hands are better than one. I'm sure they will get out quite soon. For now, myself and I are going to head back onto uh, the cut line. And we are going to go back to the area where we last had that very, well, at the time it was very fresh male tracks. So we've been switching off the car periodically. These flies, man, they are really starting to get me going. If nothing else, I'm going to develop the, the world's biggest shoulders from smashing myself in the head all day. I 
uh, Northwest England has just uh, made a comment. Shows you how quick this interactiveness of this uh, this system that we have. How wonderful, Diana, that I get to speak to you all the way from from Juma Private Game Reserve to Northwest England. You've just said, isn't there some herbal remedy like lemon? Uh, so, uh, you've got some or other type of lemon leaf that's uh, that's where you are, and you use that as a as a, a repellent. We have citronella out here, very similar. Um, it, however, it doesn't grow where we are at the moment. So the only thing that I have used to any great success is elephant dung, and we used it last night. I actually debuted my smoker. Here it is over here. And uh, it's almost coming to the point where I need to use it again. It's a bit full of ash, I just want to empty out the ash a little bit. And then ask VM, VM, do you have your lighter on? You don't? Ah, the reason why I don't have... So I'm just going to have to suffer through the flies. I don't have a lighter with me at the moment. VM doesn't have his lighter with him at the moment. And... Uh, This is the reason, yeah, we have, we have a non-smoking policy on my game drive vehicles. And uh, for that reason, I can't light any elephant dung and I can't chase the flies away. So I suppose I'm shooting myself in the foot with that policy, but anyway. Ah, and it looks like... Eugene has managed to work his magic or Jamie managed to get out of the hole on her own She's going to be able to give you updates on that big crash now She's ready for a link and I'm sure has got quite a lot to tell you So we're going to go back into the area with that leopard We'll give you an update as soon as we can Stay tuned And as you can see, Brian and myself have finally made our way out of the slight predicament that we were in. So while I was driving, we must have driven straight into a couple of disused old warthog burrows, probably started by an aardvark, and then finished off by the warthogs. And as we drove over it, it collapsed completely underneath us to the point that the base of the car, the chassis of the car, was almost sitting on the ground. And despite our best jacking efforts, we couldn't quite get it up and about on our own, so we called in Eugene, and Eugene came flying to our rescue, and after a little bit of sprinting through the bush to try and lead him into where we were, as we were right in the middle of the block, we managed to get him in. And we very, very carefully negotiated and planned our way around it so that he wouldn't drive into the same minefield I did. And as we started jacking, Eugene got a little bit stuck. The Mahindra disappeared into a hole as well. Luckily, we were able to dig it out and pack it up. And unfortunately, during this event, Eugene suffered a slight scratch to his arm due to the logs that we were stuffing underneath the wheels. But we are out and about, it was quite the adventure. And I'm now on the search for Tingana. Last seen heading in this direction. Checking very, very carefully for his tracks. There's been a bit of traffic on this road since we were last with you. I'm just wondering where he decided to head from the last position we saw him in. disappeared into the realms of Warthog underground world. We were lucky enough to witness Tingana 
doing that rasping, sawing sound that they do, that leopards do. And Carol, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering what he was doing and why he was doing it. That's a very typical territorial call from both male and female leopards. They will both do that. Although the male leopards are generally the ones that create that incredibly deep rasping sound. And it goes on for a little bit longer than the females. And in that particular circumstance, although he was definitely patrolling and marking territory as well, I also think that he was calling to shadow. So if you were with us from the beginning of the Sunrise Safari, we were actually on Shadow and Sindile's tracks before we found Tingana, and that was what the Kudu had been barking at. So we got slightly sidetracked by following those alarm calls. And I think he was searching for Shadow, who I suspect came back to fetch Sindile and take him to a kill. And Mavis, you wanted to know that if he was calling for Shadow, would she call back? And I think in this case she definitely would, since we do strongly suspect that Sindile could, could well be Tingana's son for a start, and we have heard reports of them sharing kills together in the past. They have been seen together, all three of them, feeding together. So there's a very good chance that Shadow would have responded to him, but her call would have been slightly softer and quite possibly too soft for us to hear. that Tingana could well be Sindile's father. And I know Zeus and George were a little bit worried about whether or not Tingana would pose any kind of threat to Sindile. And Sherry was wondering if he would recognize him as his own offspring. There's a very clever tactic that female leopards use. When they do come into estrus, they will try and mate with as many males in the area to ensure that none of those males know whether or not they are the father of her cubs and thereby completely reducing and sometimes eliminating the risk unless it's a marauding male coming in from a different side reducing the risk that their cubs are going to be killed by a male who is looking to propagate his own genes in this case Tingana wouldn't necessarily recognize Sindile as his cub but he would know that he mated with Shadow. So he would recognize and know that he mated with a female in this area and that she would have had cubs. And he would automatically take on the assumption that the cub is his. Now, I'm not sure how often this works out for the female leopards. I know it's a fairly successful technique. I couldn't give you exact percentages. But the males will definitely be more inclined to look after the youngsters. In this particular case, we know for certain that Shadow's method was successful, regardless of whether or not Tingana is Sindile's father, and there is a very strong possibility that he is. Completely re disregarding that fact, we have heard of them sharing a space and sharing a kill together, and that was a couple of weeks ago on Hoffman's property just south of our boundaries. So Tingana definitely has been fooled, or maybe not, maybe Sindile is his offspring, but either way, he believes Sindile to be his cub, and so he has taken it on board that he will, and it's assumed that he will not in any way be a threat to Sindile. Now I'm almost certain that that is what Tingana was doing. He was looking for shadow, he scent marked a lot in the area, and then he moved through and had a very, very good sniff around. And he was quite clearly looking for her. And I know that we must have just missed Shadow and Sindile crossing. I'm going to look around. I don't believe they've come all the way to this side. So let's look around quickly to Triple M. 
Now, the situation, I'm not entirely sure, but I would say that the situation is very, very different if Shadow were to encounter the Anderson Mail. And we have been discussing the possibility that that is why Shadow has pushed into this western side of her territory, almost actually coming into her mother Karula's territory. And that could well be because Anderson is pushing more and more from the in from the west around this Arethusa side and he's been seen fairly regularly in that area and often challenging Tingana for his authority there. that Sindiri would be much more under threat by the Anderson mail. Tingana, or I suspect that Tingana was calling to find out where Shadow was. And Anne was wondering whether or not that would be, surely she wouldn't be ready to breed, so why would he be calling to her? And she definitely wouldn't be ready to breed. Sindelia is not yet old enough. It will have to wait for probably another six months to a year before she comes back into estrus but he's still associating with the various females of within his territory and checking up on them every now and again and although leopards are not social creatures it's not unheard of for the males and females to encounter each other as they move through territories and maybe spend a little bit of time with each other regardless of whether or not they're breeding that Tingana was mating with Kutile not too long ago and that is absolutely true he was unfortunately we didn't get to find them but we did see him towards the end of that period as he was moving through and just warning the Anderson male away from his lady friend but that that's not unheard of for leopards to move off as soon as the female is finished mating or they've finished mating which they would have done by now so he's left Quatile, I'm not sure where she's gone, and he's moved on. for the tracks to see if they come out in any side here and possibly cross into Arethusa. Otherwise, there's also a strong possibility that Tingana has gone flat for a while and just lay down somewhere in the shade, possibly not too far from our particular commotion, although I think he probably would have moved away from us a little bit. And Angie, you were wondering if the Anderson male has been seen mating with any females in the area not that i've heard about um, i could you know he does tend to also move around beyond our borders towards elephant plains and south of arethusa i would say it's a distinct possibility that he has been just because he is quite a big dominant male and he's fully capable of defending a territory just stopping to check here about the Anderson male 
is that the area that he is in at the moment, or that he has been patrolling in, is where Salayesh, or the, for those of you who don't know who that is, she's a female leopard who's dominant in the Simbambili elephant plains area, who has a very, very young cub. So he definitely doesn't have a mating opportunity with her. tracks coming out anywhere on the road. There has been a great deal of traffic though. I did hear a report from one of the guides that she'd found Shadow and Sindile's tracks crossing into Arethusa. But I still don't see Tingana's tracks coming out on this side. I'm going to do one more loop and just double check and see if he's not tucked away in that block somewhere very close to where we lost him. that our digging experiences have certainly warmed me up considerably after our chilly start to the morning. And I suspect he would have come out somewhere in this region, just judging by the general direction that his tracks were going in this nice open clearing here and plenty of sand so I should be picking up on his tracks whether or not there's been traffic over them to just check these game paths a little bit more thoroughly to just go and investigate that termite mound with a tree it is definitely a long shot I'm just looking at where there is the most shade and wondering if Tingana didn't possibly decide to go flat he's probably been patrolling his territory all night so it could be that he take, he's taking a little break before he continues on his mission to find Shadow and Sindile Definitely a long shot, but let's have a look. And then I'm going to loop back towards the road, but I'm going to continue off-road and just check some of the shady patches and termite mounds in the area, just because I still haven't seen those tracks coming out. We were roughly 100 meters that way, stuck in a hole. He was walking very much in this general direction. Let's keep looking. It's not get stuck in that hole. I've had enough of holes for the morning. And I feel 
like we might be entering another landmine trap. So we'll go back the way we came, which I know is safe. I'm feeling a little bit like erring on the side of avoiding the holes. Nothing hiding in the shade here or up the tree. Tingana, where are you hiding? And we've been chatting about the Anderson male and the various dominant males in this area. And both Blair and John seem to agree that the last time that the Anderson male was seen mating was with that Salayesh female from Elephant Plains. I'm just going to check this last term I found. And that they suspected that the litter of cubs had been lost. And I know that Salayesh does have, that's sort of how we pronounce it with the X. Um, it's spelt sort of Salix, if you want to read it literally. But I know that Salayesh does have a cub now. I'm not sure if it's a male or a female. I think it is around the age of three months old, but I could be wrong. Obviously, I've never seen her. She tends to move through elephant plains more regularly. And no sign of Tingana here. Might be time to expand our search onto Arethusa. And I think our best chance for the moment is to go and look for where Shadow's tracks were last seen and see if Tingana's following up from that side. No more holes, please. No more holes. So it's entirely possible that that cub that Salayesh does have is the Anderson male's cub. I know you've had a hard morning.
me for one moment. I think I might have acquired a passenger under my car, which is a stick, possibly from somewhere during our monkey thorn, monkey orange thicket traversing. No, I don't see anything. I could hear something sort of tapping and catching. And I don't want to put Jigger through any more than it has already been through this morning. Both Brian and myself have dust pretty much everywhere. I've got it up my nose and in my ears. I'm sure Brian is the same. <laughs> now, we have to make a decision between checking, which I've done thoroughly, and moving fairly quickly. And I think I'm gonna try and move very, very rapidly down and across and then up through the block. I hope that we get lucky. I'm also going to switch my radio on to Arethusa channel. So I can hear the updates from those guides. Now we're kind of equidistant between two roads where Shadow's tracks were seen crossing into Arethusa. So let's loop around this side. of the triple M boundary. One good thing about coming into Arethusa now is that I generally, generally, don't need to have a map with me at all times. checking both in the undergrowth as well as in the trees. Now I know that Shadow has something of a reputation for not hoisting her kills, so dragging them up into trees, but the distance that she had covered to go and fetch some delay this morning, I wonder whether she wouldn't have put it up somewhere safe just to keep it out of reach of any kind of hyena activity.
almost exactly where Shadow's tracks crossed Triple M and onto Arethusa, and I still haven't seen any tracks coming out on this side. I do want to just hop out and take a little bit of a walk, so we're going to cross back across to Steph to see how his morning's tracking has been going. We'll catch up with you a little bit later. Well, we've now figured out why those monkeys weren't going to call and why uh, the Nyala and everything were, were not going to give us uh, an alarm call. Is this male leopard literally has just gone parallel to his original course of action. I'm going to show you his tracks. It's taken myself and VM since we last saw you to now to decipher. But we've got fresh tracks of a male leopard heading down this road. And I'm going to try and show you what we're busy looking at. What took us so long to decipher? But we've got two sets of tracks. One definitely fresher than the other. And... Uh, let me show you what uh, what it is we're busy looking at. <laughs> the flies have been crazy. I've actually marked the the tracks here yeah, for you so you can follow just in front of the scratch mark is the track have a look if you can see it as we move forward slowly slowly some of the clearer ones that we are looking at. Anyway, and that's what we're busy trying to decipher for you. It's been a mad day trying to, trying to juggle between finding enough time to get off and decipher these tracks and uh, actually present the show. There's always a fine balance between the two. I can still see his tracks heading down the road. So the trick here is going to be deciding whether or not He's, ah, he's gone across. Yeah, I can see his track right there, VM. Next to the elephant dunk. Yeah, I won't reach there. This, this one here. That one. Oh, sorry, no, it is this elephant dunk. Right now. Sorry. Show you what made me think that he's carried on going straight instead of... His, his track is there. Doesn't look like much, but that's a male leopard track heading down the road. That's enough of a clue for us to carry on going. Oh, stalling the car. Flies messing with my mojo. Got him on this game path. <laughs> See if we can pick up his tracks again here. Yeah. I could be lying anywhere at this stage. Just making 100% sure that he's actually crossing out onto any of these game ponds that we got going over here. He has, these tracks have been difficult substrate, not the easiest to track a male leopard in. And he did lead us on a bit of a goose chase down that 
drainage line for a bit. It must have caught the scent of something. Okay, so as we come up here, another quick look to see if we can see his tracks. And the quick answer to that question, oh, here we go. So let me show you what we're talking about. give you. Um, so the stick is your marker. Okay. I go this way. Sorry, left. There we go. Oh, hang on, wait. You bring left, left, left a bit more. In the middle of your screen. Uh, there, let me just bring my finger down. There we go. <laughs> That's the leopard track. very good very promising I think if we had come this way this morning we probably would have bumped into him but of course I was looking in the wrong direction not too much a problem as I say I have this bio exclusive zone around my car when it comes down to leopards if you see a leopard with me that I've actually managed to track and find uh, it's definitely caused to bring out the champagne that's for sure a male leopard that enjoys lying on top of termite mounds and here we've got a couple of big termite mounds around here and if his tracks don't come out on the road here no still on the road Chaos, my brain is in too many places around here. So while we are uh, while we are carrying on to see where this male leopard has gone, I think uh, Jamie is also wanting to give you a bit of an update on what's happening with her tracks and tracking around uh, Tingana. So we're going to throw you over to Jamie quickly, and um, I hope she's got better luck than I do so far. And from hot leopard tracks to not so hot leopard tracks I still haven't managed to locate where shadows come through on this side we are right on our northern boundary of Arethusa I'm going to have to cross back onto triple M again and still no sign of these elusive leopards it's absolutely phenomenal how you can see a leopard know it's there and then it disappears for a couple of minutes and it's completely vanished and that's partly to do with the fact that the way that leopards move can be so unpredictable, the way that they bob and weave in between the bushes. as we do in case we lose a bit of signal. Poor Jigger, here is springs creaking. one more check on the vehicle um, it is making some funny funny creaking sounds 
But while I do that, Tony in Holland was wondering about the survival rates of leopard cubs. Bear with me one second. I will be with that question in a, just a moment. Okay. There's nothing that's going to do any permanent damage, but our springs just popped out. We'll have to jack the car up again when we get home and make sure that it's up and ready and running by this afternoon sunset safari. Just need to jack it up and push the spring back into place. That was the wheel that found the hole, so to speak. And back to Tony's question. Now, the question was to do with the gender of the various leopard cubs that we see in this area. And while they've been watching this amazing show, they were saying that... Sorry, just, just thought I saw a leopard track, but I think I've just got leopards on the brain. They've seen more male cubs than female cubs. And typically the survival rate for leopard cubs at any age is pretty much the same, regardless of gender. So when they're young, they have a very, very, very high mortality rate. It's a hard life for a female leopard raising cubs in this area. And they've got their work cut out for them between the lions and the hyenas. And even buffalo, if they find hidden leopard cubs, will set out to kill them. So the mortality rate for young cubs is about the same. But in fact, the mortality rate once they reach a year to two years old is higher for male leopards. So the fact that we've only really seen male leopard cubs around over the f past few months is just because that is how it's worked out. It's just a coincidence. And Sindile is reaching a very, very um, important time of his life now. He's going to have to be incredibly careful, especially as he starts to gain more and more independence from mum. And he will stay with her a lot longer than female cubs normally would. He'll stay in her area, learning to hunt and gaining that little bit of independence. And then move on from there. But once he does move away from her, his life gets a lot, lot riskier. As he's got to fight for and find his own territory. and myself have spent the morning tracking leopards. We got very, very lucky when we found Tengana because we were in fact tracking Sindile and Shadow, so a male cub and his female mother. And Rochelle from the UK was wondering how it is we tell the difference between male and female tracks. Now typically it is generally entirely sized based. So female tracks are really, really quite small. They're about this big. Really, really small. Oh, corrugations on the road. Let's get away from these. So even Sindile, who is a year old cub, his feet are already almost double the size of his mother's. So there is an enormous size difference between male and female. But I have heard of females, one or two exceptions to that rule, females that have absolutely enormous feet, almost as big as a male. And then it becomes a little bit more tricky and you start to look at the edges of the back pad. So for males, they have right at the base where the back pad joins to those three lobes that are typical of, ma of, male, of leopards or big cats. Right at the base, and males have a very, very angular, or sorry, females have a very, very angular back pad that then loops up from those three lobes. Whereas the males tend to have a slightly more rounded loop around their back pads. It can be very difficult to see and it comes with a little bit of time and practice and experience. And in this case, we have this added advantage of years worth of following the various leopards that are in this area 
and that really really helps because it gives you such a background knowledge into which animals are moving through whereabouts their territories are and what's happening so if i'd come in completely fresh this morning if i'd never worked on juma before if i'd never watched the show and i'd come in and i'd seen those tracks of shadow and sindile i might even have been fooled into thinking that shadow was walking with an older male just because sindile's tracks are absolutely enormous he's really really got big big feet now but because i have been here for the last few weeks and i have been watching the show and I've been chatting to the various presenters who've been here a little bit longer than I have it was immediately I immediately knew who it was that we were tracking Tingana I must say was a bit of a surprise and I what really gave his position away was the alarm calls of those kudu that were calling in response to him and I think that when we went right to find Tingana and follow those alarm calls Shadow and Sindile had gone left and cross back across Triple M's boundary. great feedback from our exciting experience i'm going to use the word exciting and i use it actually completely truthfully it has been a learning curve and we've got some exciting feedback from that particular experience charlie you were wondering if if elephants ever fall into those burrows or whether it's just something that um hapless guides happen to stumble into whilst keeping an eye on the leopard they're following and yes they definitely would I think that elephants are pretty smart for the most part. They're generally very well aware of what's happening around them, but I do think that an elephant could well accidentally stumble into one of these holes. And then we were wondering about my lucky jackal skull. Here we go. It's back on. Maybe you're right. Maybe it was because um, because I didn't have my mascot on board that we fell into a patch of bad luck. I've got my mascot back on. Hopefully it will bring us better luck for the sunset safari this afternoon and I will know exactly where I will be returning to because I have just picked up on Shadow's tracks crossing through. They're not as fresh. They're from early, probably late last night when she went to fetch Sandile, but at least we've got a basic direction in which to start for our sunset safari. And Anna Marie, thank you for your compliments. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a particularly skilled mechanic. Uh, it was just simply a matter of necessity there. And popping the spring back in is really just a matter of levers and jacks to push it back in. At least we did get to see Tingana and it was a really, really fantastic sighting. It's one of the, uh, one of the only times, I think it's the third time that I've actually seen him. So I'm still really, really excited. I also learned a great deal about that particular block and off-roading there. And next time I will definitely be on the lookout for that network of burrows that seems to encompass most of the middle of that block. And I won't be driving into any holes anytime soon. But a big thank you to you all for sitting for viewing the sunset sunrise safari. We did have a wonderful time with you. And a big thank you to Brian, not only for his camera work with Tingana, but also for helping dig us out and rocking the car and generally being incredibly helpful in the fairly stressful situation. So a big thank you to him. 
And for now, I'm going to say goodbye to you all, and I will see you on the Sunset Safari, hopefully with Shadow, Sindile, and maybe even Tingana thrown into the mix. So join us then. And this is the last area where we've had some tracks of, uh, of this big male leopard that we've been tracking this morning, myself and VM. Um, we've unfortunately run out of time, but myself and VM are going to carry on tracking this little guy for a little bit longer just to see where he goes for this afternoon safari. And uh, I've had some fun today. It's, it's been a good morning. Birmingham boys right early in the morning, and then this leopard track to puzzle over, and then of course the ever-present flies that are just driving us uh, insane. Um, but we look forward to this afternoon with you, the Sunset Safari here. And uh, from at least myself and VM, uh, we just want to say thank you very much for today. Thanks for all your questions and your interactivity. And we'll catch up with you soon. Have a nice day. Bye.